Welcome back, Source Nation. You're listening live to The Pendulum with Dr. Samori Swigert. Source Nation, welcome back to the Pendulum. I'm your host, Dr. Samori Swagger, a.k.a. Doc Swag. Yes, I'm in the building. There's somebody else in the building, though. As I stated earlier, we're talking with Professor Carl Tone Jones. We're going to be discussing his new film project and some of the hot-button issues of today. Um, and I, I just, just for those that may have missed the introduction, just want to make sure I give you a little taste of, to know what you're dealing with here. Um, <laughs> Professor Carlton Jones, I actually had the, the, the honor to be introduced to him by uh, a good brother, Joseph Ward, uh, from uh, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. Um, he has a very good app, uh, African history app that you should get on your phone also, so check that out. Um, but I was introduced to Professor Carlton Jones through Joseph Ward, uh, the creator of that app. And, you know, Professor Jones has these office hours uh, that he hosts online on YouTube and Facebook, and I believe also on Periscope. I know on Facebook and uh, YouTube he definitely holds these uh, throughout the week. And, you know, he he gives his commentary. Um, It's potent, it's hot, it's stimulating, it's zestful, um, and he's talking about economic progress. He's talking about um, community development, African culture, education, how we can uplift our children, how we can uplift our women, how we can uplift our men. Um, and it's just, just really just that clarion call. That's what I call it. It's a clarion call uh, in these trying times. We're, we're definitely in some tumultuous times, some precarious times, unpredictable times. And, and it's good that we have a strong, bold voice that isn't afraid to speak truth to power. So we have uh, individuals such as Professor Carlton Jones uh, to be here and have discussion with us. We have to take time and listen to this brother. Uh, Professor Carlton Jones, how are you doing, brother? Oh, peace and black power, King. What's going on? <laughs> I'm doing good. Peace, brother. Peace, peace. How you feeling? I'm feeling great, man. I'm feeling great. And first and foremost, thank you for bringing me back to Source Radio, man. It's been a minute since I've been on. So, um, you know, and, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to live up to the intro, bro. You know what I mean, <laughs> set, the, set the ball pretty high, but um, we're going to keep it pu- we're going to keep it pushing. <laughs> oh no, no, no! Please, 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 man! Just you know, just just so people can kind of uh, feel you out and just be a little tangible. Um, tell us just a little bit about yourself, just so people can get a little acclimated to you. Okay. You know, where you're from? Um, what you do? Well, I'm from Philadelphia, North Philly to be precise. And uh, mm-hmm. one of the things that um, I've been, I've always been a history buff. Always been into history, learning history. Uh, so uh, I, I came into the idea of black empowerment and the movement of black empowerment pretty late in the game in my development as far as I was concerned because I was able to see, you know, through historical context um, how the, how targeted the black community became from the institutions mm-hmm. and instruments of white supremacy and how mm-hmm. all of these different you know, I mean, no matter when you're talking about a plague or no, no matter when you talk about sometimes something happening, an event happening, that black people have always have been the focal point of disaster, you know. And, and um, you know, I mean, we can go back to chattel slavery, but we can, you know, I mean, we can even go further back than that to, you know, all the empires in Europe and how they consistently, consistently um, bombarded the, the, the shores of Africa, trying to invade Africa for all of its resources. Um, and then you bring it to modern times to talk about the different laws and the different uh, ways that black people have been attacked and, um, and, and you know, we deal with the system that's been put in place and have an understanding that the, the, no other people have dealt with, you know, a system or power structure that was specifically designed to limit their ability, to limit their access to wealth, to limit their access to liberty, to limit their access to freedom and liberation you know, um, mm. to build the building and grow amongst themselves. So, you know, I take those um, teachings and learn, especially from my elders and ancestors, you know, Dr. Amos Wilson, you know, Dr. John Everett Clark, I mean, some of the foremost 
aforementioned names, uh, uh, Dr. You know, Mount King, uh, even in dealing with some of the uh, the uh, and, you know Malcolm X, without saying uh, the Panther Party, Panther Movement, you know, uh, and you deal with all of the different, uh, you know, the 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 history of how we have struggled, and not struggled, but tried to work towards um, some sort of um, freedom and how the struggle mm-hmm. is consistent, not just consistently um, thwarted, but you know, how systems and, and uh, government agencies have gone out of their way to sabotage these movements that because black independence or black access, access to wealth of black people would seem to be detriment to the development and to the procurement of what we call America. So mm-hmm. um, I'm working with, uh, I, I do a lot of work in the community with children. You know, I have an organization called What About Us? And one of the things we do is we try to empower black children um, on the principles of community, on the principles of black empowerment. Um, we have a sub-startup business that the children created, um, the community team squad. So, you know, I pay them, you know, uh, money that I used to spend going out to parties, going out to bars, you know, or just at the liquor store. You know, since I don't mm-hmm. engage in those activities no more, you know, I take that money and I pay the children in the community to, to um, clean up the community, keep the community clean, to mm-hmm. and also pride. Um, mm-hmm. One of the other things we do is, you know, um, every, you know, we started last year, uh, two years ago, and we're going to pick it up this year, we have the What About Us Book Reading Initiative where we challenge, you know, and pay children to read books. So um, mm. if you read a book, you get paid, period. You know, you get a small stipend. But if you read mm. a book about Africans, Africans in America, by Africans, by Africans in America, or any African of the diaspora, you get paid more. And the purpose of mm. that is to instill the, the, the empowerment of knowing that learning for you, learning about yourself, learning about your culture, more important than becoming indoctrinated into a system or indoctrinated into readings that are not based on, you know, um, your community growth. So, you know, we're, you know, we're constantly moving and constantly striving to, to build. Um, I'm in and out of high schools uh, on occasion when they'll have, <laughs> sometimes I might be a little too much and they, they might have to say, you know, we have to do a break or whatever. But whenever I get a chance to in and out of high schools, community centers and so forth, and I'm working in the community, I'm working with the youth, whether I'm in Philly, whether I'm in New York, whether I'm in Baltimore, no matter where I'm at, you know, there's black people and black children, we're building towards black empowerment. Mm. Mm. Awesome, brother. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I love that. I love that. I didn't even know about the, the, the book, the book reading initiative. That's, 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 that's really dope, man. Um, now I want to ask you a question. Um, listening to what you were saying, um, and the way that you describe the atmosphere, the climate, the social climate that we're surviving in. Um, men, the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, um, he's, he's very outspoken, very revered amongst our own, um, hated amongst uh, many Europeans that think he, you know, <laughs> when you speak truth to power, sometimes you offend people. But he said something that some people hate and some people understand. And but basically he was saying that the Donald Trump administration was a necessary thing for black Americans to wake up and come together. Um what do you think about that? Well, I agree in some ways with that. Um in fact I would say if I had to put a percentage on it, I agree with that somewhere in the 90th percentile, um, because mm-hmm. it, it should have been an awakening for our community, especially members of our community who consistently like to hit the snooze button on our issues, the snooze button on taking command and, and actually getting out in front of issues of black empowerment. So yes. um, it, it, it sort of, Donald Trump provided clarity for, for all mm. the brothers and sisters who have been saying all along, this is a system of white supremacy that we live in the system of white supremacy. If you had any doubt, then a president getting elected, running on the platform of institutional racism and white supremacy should have been the wake-up call that everybody, in regards to understanding our alignment and understanding our um, place in society, you know, um, and, and how places and how the country 
all black people. Uh, before Donald Trump got elected, there was this whole idea, you know, um, of passiveness that we had as a community in terms of dealing with, you know, uh, in dealing with all of the, the different uh, entities, you know, um, saying that we live in a post-racial society, being extremely tolerant to impoverished and oppressive conditions, you know, overly conditioned to not criticize the black president because, you know, it was um, blasphemy, but to accept the policies of, of um, benign neglect that took place in our communities, no one was being held accountable for the abusive policies of the, of the state towards the community, whether it's through police brutality or police terrorism, as I like to call it, whether it's through mm-hmm. gentrification, where we're being uprooted out of our homes. And, you know, um, while our neighborhoods are consistently, you know, um, turned into galleries, inviting mm. people who are not black into our community, giving them government stipends, giving them community stipends so that they don't have to pay back taxes on properties or liens on properties, but they can open up mm. and establish businesses. But we do put a block on local, you know, people who live in those communities, black people who live in those communities who are trying to buy and rebuy and beautify their communities. You put the stranglehold on that. All those things happen over the last 20 years. And the thing is now that the, the ball has been rolling to a point where you know, it's become sort of like background noise. So the election mm. of Donald Trump sort of like with a splash of cold water on what we've been dealing mm. with in America. You wake up and you turn around and say, wait a minute, you know, we are dealing with <laughs> institutional white supremacy, you know, and what's happening is, you know, now there's no denial. There's no room for anybody to deny what's happening. And right. we, had that, we, we had that little um, buffer zone. And um, and, uh, and so if Hillary got, would have got elected, two things would have happened. One, as black people, we would have hit the snooze button because, mm. you know, um, there was a lot of black people who thought that Hillary still was, you know, we, the Clinton name sort of carries weight. And unfortunately, still carries weight in our community. And in addition to the um, Clinton name, you know, um, the second thing that would have happened is we would have had to deal with a lot of white vigilanteism because there were a lot of angry um, white militias, white militia groups who were talking about encroaching and coming into urban centers, black communities, and, you know, um, doing, uh, you know, committing um, acts of war towards the community. Mm. So we, you know, those are the things, you know, as, as a community, we are not prepared to deal with that type of tech carnage. As much as we like to think that, you know, we're tough, street, this, that, and the other, we're not organized to deal with a militia. You know, all you have to do is to go back to Ferguson and realize that the same people that were pointing guns at the government at the Bundy Ranch out there in um, Utah and the same people who were pointing guns at the government at the uh, Oregon um, Refuge Center, you know, Mm -hmm. um, were the same people that the government invited into Ferguson to perch on top of rooftops as they pointed sniper rifles at black um, protesters in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, after the, the Mike Brown uprisings. Mm. You understand mm. the organization, you know, the earth, they, these are the oath keepers, the birthers, you know, these are the groups that have already been, you know, put, they, they, they pretty much work hand in hand with the government when it comes to encroaching on us. They have an understanding of code and white supremacy. So they'll be at war with one another, but they understand to stay on code when it comes to battling us. So mm. then you see that united front. So, you know, we wouldn't have been prepared to deal with that united front had that had Hillary Clinton got elected because, you know, that underground network, that underground circuit system that they had put in place would have been engaged. And um, you would have seen, you know, white supremacist cells, my prediction, you would have seen white supremacist cells unleashing terror in the black community all over the country. Mm. Brother, you, 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 you're, you're holding court. You're holding court. It's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you, and I'm just like, as you're talking, I'm listening. I'm, I'm summating everything. I'm thinking of all those people that, like you said, that went up against the, uh, the government for the Bundy Ranch. I'm thinking about the, uh, the, the biker gang shootout in Texas. You know, you had all these things uh, where you saw just brazen, blatant, outright, uh, the most ostentatious uh, assault or violation of law um, to America in the public, and 
it just kind of the 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 penalties has in the court cases, the trials, it's kind of gone quiet. We we haven't really heard too much of well, what would, what was the follow up, what was the aftermath, what were the results of this, and and I'm pretty sure a lot of this stuff is just kind of like that slap on the wrist, you know, um, the same people that are at the refuge or at the Bundy Ranch or in the shootout, they may be the second and third cousins of some of the lawmakers in Congress and things of that nature. So very good, um, very, very good uh, connecting of the dots. Now, uh, what I want to do oh, you, real quick. Before you yeah, go, yeah, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I want to touch on some of that, though, because the, the Bundy, the trial for the, um, when, when the burglars, the old keepers, excuse me, when they went on trial, the case was, um, they, they had their trial. And you got to remember, mm-hmm. one of them got through a shootout with, a, with an FBI agent and got killed. You know, um, oh. they destroyed public property. The, when they went on trial, they were found not guilty by, a, a, you know, a jury of their peers. You know? mm. So when you start talking about, and you talk about the attack that took place on the mosque, you got to remember that white supremacy focuses on the code, but they also use code. So when everybody's talking anti-Muslim this or anti-this or the other, this really is code for black. Urban, code for black. Chicago, code for black. Everything they're doing, they're codifying their words and their language. They understand it very well. And they're speaking what was called Orwellian double talk. You know, Orwellian mm-hmm. double talk is when you say something, but you're passing a secret message. Only you and somebody else or you and other members of your collective understand that message but you're speaking in public, so you're sending messages in plain sight. So, you know, this is what they're doing. And so when we start talking about paying attention to what's happening, you know, um, they, they, you know to, uh, to outline and come out and say we're attacking black people, is that religious? No, they're going to start off with attacking white Arabs. They're going to start off attacking the same the other. But eventually, just like the, the um, travel ban took place, when they um, started off saying that they were going to profile people from certain countries, you know, most of them in Africa, right? Well, mm-hmm. they also extended that courtesy to the son of Muhammad Ali here in America. He got stopped twice mm-hmm. in Atlanta and in Washington, D.C. Muhammad Ali is from Philadelphia. He was born and raised here. His father has one of the most famous names internationally. So for him to have his passport, based, and it wasn't even based on um, residency, it was just based on his name. So this is a transfer, the codified transfer of, you know, this oppressive action to black people. Just like I thought, you know, when we start talking about crime in Chicago, be careful. This is, I predicted in 2013, when we talked about the ramifications of the Zimmerman verdict, and they started talking about, um, well, what about crime in Chicago? What about black on black crime? And they started blaming black women for being single mothers and raising uh, uncouth black children to do this and the other. I said, watch out. These are going to be talking points for when they start talking martial law in our community. Now, Trump gets elected, mm. and they're talking martial law in Chicago. Now, Trump is changing up the language. So it's not even mm. martial law in Chicago. It's martial law in Chicago and other urban centers who are facing violent crime. And I think it's, you know, I, I, that raises some red flags because the second most mentioned city in regards to violence and crime uh, was over the last year outside of Chicago, Philadelphia. Well, I live here. Mm. You know, I drove through mm. Baltimore during the Freddie Gray uprising. I saw the tanks. I saw the pepper spray. I saw them disappearing people off of the streets. So this is mm. stuff where they've been practicing urban warfare here in America for a long time, going into poor black neighborhoods like out in Oakland, you know, and different places in the country, and they've been practicing urban warfare, kicking down doors, acting like they're looking for terrorists. And we, mm. lo and behold, and everybody's aligned with Black Lives Matter, and so we but surely Black Lives Matter is being identified as a terrorist organization. So if you're black and you're outspoken, you're Black Lives Matter, it, and it doesn't take too long for them to uh, align those dominoes so when they fall on you, you're all black terrorists. And they even had something recently where Breitbart did a story on um, black groups here in Philadelphia meeting solely in the exclusionary of white folks, and it was picked up by a reporter here in Philadelphia, and she doubled down on it. And there was a sister who picked up on it, and by her picking up on the story, it gives credence to Breitbart's story and saying that we are having terrorists, the development of terrorist cells. 
and this is why we're not inviting whites into the community. So these are very dangerous innuendos and precedents that are being set, and these are something we need to pay attention to because the propaganda game is huge. You know, whole black towns were destroyed for the propaganda, propagandizing black men chasing white women, and they created the King Kong complex, and they started burning down villages, burning down communities. We're talking about Rosewood. We're talking about Tulsa. We're talking about um, Charleston. We're talking about Raleigh. We're talking about mm. Wilmington. You know, we're talking about mm. Greenwood. We're talking about all these different cities that were burned down, East St. Louis, you know, even riots here in Philadelphia. You know, 1918 was a bloody year. They had riots in Washington, D.C. They had riots in Chicago. So with all of these different times when all these things are happening, we got to pay attention. They were all created with propaganda, using political cartoons, because at that time, the majority of the white population couldn't read past the third grade. So they were using political cartoons in order to create those types of um, misnomers and to give credence and permission for them to go into black communities and start riots. Remember, race riots, in the black, when we talk about race riots, these were angry white mobs coming into black communities and destroying it, coming into mm. black communities and burning them down, coming into black communities and killing children and women, you know, gunning them down, using old um, relics and um, old, old positions from the, left over from the Civil War. You know, these, uh, these were, um, you know, uh, uh, black communities that were destroyed, black wealth that was taken and destroyed, stolen. The black folks were threatened with the, within the inch of, an inch of their life if they ever returned to that land that was burned down. Mm. Mm. So we have to pay attention to the whole game because they don't attack us in one area. They attack us in full spectral dominance. So they attack us everywhere. This is why we have, you know, um, uh, children right now dealing with mental health issues and, and bodies because they've been doc- they, 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 they fed us the drugs and they fed us the inoculation. So now 90, not 90%, but a higher percentage, an uh, exponential, exponential percent of our children are growing over autism now. You know, mm-hmm. um, they're poisoning the water, they're oversaturating. Um, Zaza Ali wrote a book, and in her book she talked about how they oversaturate black communities with lead and, uh, chlor- and fluoride. In our water system, my drinking system is predominantly black neighborhood. And when you look at the chemical makeup and what those things do to, to you, they first dull your senses and then they make you, they, they infuse and cause anger, you know, anger, and trigger anger responses because, you know, um, if the frustration that's developed from being in a situation where you can't figure something out, where you can't identify what's bothering you, but yet until you have that anger and frustration and then you just take it out and it stunts your development growth. You're looking at Flint, Michigan, where they're drinking and bathing in rusted water, all right, where they say it's going to take at least a year to fix. Well, who's going to come back from that? There's no coming. There's permanent damage being done. And then when I tell people in Philadelphia, we talk about Flint, but the toxicity, the lead toxicity in Philadelphia is twice as high as Flint. We're like, a word? (laughs) (laughs) So we need to start doing it. We need to start taking some action in regards to those things, right? But, um... You know, yeah, that, 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 that's a crazy situation we find ourselves in. And a lot of people have a hard time believing that human beings will put human beings in this situation. But as they explain, the mindset of the European is not about fairness. It's not about equality. It's about winning. It's about dominance. domination. And as long as they say genetic, genetic, uh, genetic annihilation, they are in this to the end. Source Nation, you are listening to The Pendulum with Dr. Samori Swagger, a.k.a. Doc Swag, and on, we're having a conversation with Professor Carl Tone Jones. If you want to call in and chime in, I mean, he's laying it out for you layer by layer. He is giving you the script. He is giving you the blueprint, the manual of what is going on and what's being laid out in the future. You want to call in the number 619 619- Nine twenty four zero nine thirty three six one nine nine twenty four zero nine thirty three. So now, Professor Carl Tone Jones, like I said, has laid out that blueprint. He's giving you the evidence. He's giving you the events. He's giving you the timeline. He's giving you the circumstances. And with all that said, he has mustered up his creative side and his resources. And I believe he is working on putting something out to the community and to the public where we might 
start seeing solutions and how we can participate in that. And it's called the Independence Day Project. So you, you've heard, he, I mean, he has clearly elucidated and illuminated what the problems are and what, what's on the horizon. Um, and so, uh, Professor Carl Tom Jones, can you tell us about this new film project that you're working on? Yes, sir. Um, the Independence Day Project uh, is a movie where we question or we ask the question, what does an independent black community, free of white supremacy, free of oppression, free of roadblocks, free of obstacles, what does that independent black community look like? You know, um, if we can imagine, take our vision and start visioning that, what would that look like? And then the second part of that question is, well, what do we have to do to get mm. from where we are to that promised land, to that paradise, to that place that we call black liberation, black independence? What do we do to get to that? Mm. And, um, you know, I came about the project. Um, long story short, uh, a friend of mine came to a lecture of mine at um, Black and Nobel Bookstore. And um, he left halfway through the lecture because he said the lecture was making him angry because, you know, he wanted to, <laughs> he wanted to take out with somebody <laughs> not black. So, <laughs> but he was a movie maker, right? He, this, this brother had made a, a local, you know, a hood movie. And um, mm-hmm. came to me that night and he asked, well, what, what would that look like, the things you talked about? What would that look like if we actually put that into a movie? So at the time, we were talking about theatrical film. So this is like 2013. Uh, we were talking about doing the theatrical work. And um, things happened, you know, certain unfortunate circumstances occurred. Uh, one of his partners who helped him work on, you know, his movie had died, you know, had health-related issues and died. So he sort of moved on to other areas and started working on other areas, you know. It's, just, it's a brilliant brother, an entrepreneur, so he's working in other areas. But that idea stuck with me, so I started doing Block Talk Radio the next summer. And while we were doing Block Talk Radio, um, I had started asking a question, you know, to people who have been in, you know, the, the field or the area of black empowerment, people who have made it their life to speak about black empowerment. I asked the question, what would an independent black community look like if we didn't have to deal with white supremacy? And mm. it stunned me. It stunned me you know, that people, like the people who were studying this and had like 20, 30 years, 40 years into this, had never considered that question. Hmm. So, you know, I'm saying to myself, well, wow, you are all master teachers. So you could teach the history. Um, you've been teaching the history. I, you, know, you know you can run rings around me in regards to knowing and learning the history of black empowerment. You can run circles, run ramps out around and, and, you know, you know a book that every page that I know about black empowerment. But why is it that nobody has considered this question? So in regards to the question, um, so I said, you know, I started working, 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 and um, eventually I said, well, wait a minute. Where did we put this in the document? Where did we start asking some people around the country who are um, community organizers, people who are working and building within the community? Where did we ask them? you know, these questions. So I started asking brothers and sisters around the country, you know, um, you know, it's just my sister, Kara Poole, you know, she was one of the first mm-hmm. people I asked mm-hmm. in the country. And me and Kara, you know, that's my girl, man. Kara, is, that's my sister right there. You know, she's out there, LA, she, she used to be on the Source Network. Um, and she mm-hmm. was, um, um, I got asked, and I asked her, I asked a brother who did um, Wilmington on Fire, uh, Christopher Everett. I started asking people mm-hmm. in my circle. What does it look like to have a you know free and independent black community? And eventually, slowly but surely, we started building up to a point where we say, okay, let's do it. You know, so um, while I while I'm you know while the Independence Day Project is my baby, you know, because we're going to talk about the 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 what is of it. The Independence Project is our project, you know, because it's not just mm-hmm. a movie. This 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 project is about instilling. Black empowerment, but it's also about creating a shared vision of black independence, not going through the path of least resistance, but creating a path of our own, not trying to problem solve white supremacy. You can't problem solve white supremacy. It works perfectly. 
and whenever they need to tweak it, there's no so no there's no reform for us. You don't reform the system for us. It was never designed for us to work. Red Scott's decision mm-hmm. stated, no right we have no right to the white man's duty bound and respect. You know, um the fourteenth amendment basically, you know, states that we are not sovereign citizens of this country. You know, we are we are not um birth you know, we we don't have the, the natural born citizen citizenship right to this country as black people. You know, we're naturalized citizens, but we're not, we don't get the birthright of being a citizen. So our citizenship can be stripped from us at any time. You know, something nobody really talks about in terms of the 14th mm-hmm. Amendment. So, um, you know, they have to keep voting. You have to keep passing amendments so that we can still vote <laughs> in this country. So uh, when you start talking about all those things, you need to start having a, a conversation about our real sovereignty. And it's not June 19th. It's not June 10th. It doesn't have June 19th. You know, um, one of the points that Carol brought up in the film was that, um, that uh, and this is going to be featured in the film, is that, you know, uh, when, when the power system, when the power structure gets to dictate to you your freedoms, your liberties, that means they do it on their terms. They're still in control. They're still in power. They will not, so the, the, the agreements are favorable to them. So we, you know, Juneteenth was, a, was based on the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, that was something that was dictated to the community. And, mm-hmm. you know, basically the Emancipation Proclamation, as everybody knows, didn't free near slaves because Lincoln didn't control the states that he had assigned freedom and liberty for, for black slaves to. And the three states that did still work within the union, they got to keep their slaves. Their slaves. Not only that, if other states had chosen to become parts of the union and rejoin the union, they got to keep their slaves too. The only people that got reparations was after the Civil War when, when Lincoln gave reparations to the former slave owners for losing their slaves as property. So, you know, we have to, you know, look at our place in, in, in terms of history and society and understand that we need to develop a, a, a system in where we empower ourselves, working collectively, using the nine areas of human activity that Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Dr. Neely Fuller, you know, illustrate in regards to, you know, um, our community, whether you're talking about education, whether you're talking about economics, whether you're talking about sex, whether you're talking about the media, whether you're talking about politics, whether you're talking about, um, you know, the, um, excuse me, whether you're talking about culture. Well, culture, I added culture, because <laughs> we're going to talk mm-hmm. about culture. But um, right. whether you talk about these, these, these topics, we have to address each one of them. We need think tanks in all these areas to develop, you know, um, you know, plans, calculated plans in terms of how we deal with these things. We need to be up on our game in regards because, contrary to popular belief, we're running out of time. Just like mm. you know, just like with with with, um, with Hitler and the Nazis, they're coming up with the final solution for us. You know, there's a lot mm. of talk about 2035 being the year where, you know, um, they're moving forward to this uh, progressive society. And then this progressive society, when they start showing you illustrations, you don't see black people in those illustrations. So we nope. know how to use propaganda to talk about these things. Every other yes. culture and race is represented but us. So we already know that we're being X'd out. Politically speaking, you know, um, because we don't practice block voting and because we don't practice um, creating laws and lobbies and policies and so forth, you know, we're out of the loop politically speaking. Our vote is fractured. You know, so we have to develop a common base, a common knowledge. And the Independence Day Project provides that idea. It provides a roadmap for that. And it provides, the, the, you know, some instructional tools for people who are ready to start, you know, mm-hmm. taking on, um, you know, calls to action. You know, these are the calls to action because we're going to start talking about the things we need to develop internally in our community. Are we going to give the whole game plan away? Only a fool would do that. But what we're going to do is provide an instructional guide to show people if you're interested in doing things, these are some of the things you're going to want to have in place in order to build that community. And that's what we need to be at. The civil rights movement was great, you know, for, what, for its purpose and for its time. But even Dr. King said to Harry Belafonte two months before he died that he was afraid that he moved his people into a burning house. You know, mm-hmm. so... Um, and Dr. King, once he changed up his tone and started talking about black empowerment and really started talking about black empowerment, Dr. King's days were numbered. So when you start really looking at how, our, you know, um, the, the biggest threat to society, there's a hoop that the biggest threat to society is a militarized, conscious black community. So mm-hmm. when you start 
So we have to understand that in a, as a community, we need to become militarized. Not, and listen, this is not going to be sweat-free. It's not going to be blood-free. Our independence is not going to be something that you can negotiate into. Listen, right. we, it, it, nobody, nobody in the history of man has ever fought, has ever received, has ever had a bloodless revolution, has ever had an unsponsored revolution. Nobody has ever had right. that. So why would we expect that now? You know, that's how that's how America was. was. <laughs> yes, in the first. That's how America was. That's how America. That's right. Yeah, Chris mm-hmm. Addis was the first blood set. So, so, mm-hmm. and even in the, in the, and that goes to our culture and thinking too, protecting everybody non-black. You know, <laughs> so, but, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're gonna, but we're gonna be black first. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care who you pray to. Like, we're gonna be black first. When it's, when the Asian community recently was dealing with the fact that um they uh there was an incident on the airplane a few days ago. And the Asian man was dragged off the airplane. And people started talking about oppression, this, oppression, that. And you have people, even, you know, Jesse Jackson, which he's clownish at this point, you know, um, having protests at airports at um, see, O'Hara Airport in Chicago to, you know, yeah. illustrate this thing. And look, as an athlete, we got to stop caping for other causes. You know, um, I put a post on Facebook today with Blank Man because it's like a superhero with no power trying to save everybody else. And that's what we look like trying to save other communities. But when we start talking about, you know, uh, saving our community, we'll say, well, they need to send the troops into Chicago. Well, why? That's a black community. We're so capable to save everybody else. How come we can't take and save ourselves? This type of thing, if the whole community came outside, the whole community outnumbers the gang population and everybody else 10, 20 to 1 in all these neighborhoods, all these communities. If we wanted to, we could stop gang violence tomorrow if we wanted to, if we started having enough heart to deal with our own issues. These are our children. You mean these children are going to fire on their parents? They're going to fire on their mother? They might fire on their father. They ain't going to fire on their mother. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, listen, some of these deadbeat dads got to answer. They got to answer stuff. It's just, that's, that's just, it's just that simple. I'm not saying, and I'm not saying that to feed it to the stereotype, but, you know, we have an issue with that in some areas that we need to address. That's side point. So, but, you know, going back to the Asians, you know, I didn't see Asians caping for our community when uh, Peter Lang shot a car girly coming down the steps in that Brooklyn hallway. Mm. You know, I don't see – what I saw was, you know, because people try to separate it. You got Asians who – a diverse group of people, so there's Chinese and Koreans. And I'm getting to this in a second because you had the Korean beauty shops where they've been beating the hell out of black women the last, you know, mm. and it's a bit longer. They just started recording, you know. But mm. when you start talking about that particular aspect of it, the whole Asian community came forward. The pure language is Chinese. But Korean, mm. Japanese, you know, Vietnamese, mm. they all came forward. And their, mar- and their protest, you know, not, not, at my, not, not um, addressing Peter Lang for killing that brother, you know, um, in the staircase. They said it was an accident, one bullet, two victims. One bullet, two victims. That was their protest. And Peter Lane never said hmm. a yet. He wants to talk about how weak we look. The black prosecutor that was elected because we felt as though Eric Garner didn't get any justice was the one who made sure that he gave Peter Lane a get out of jail free card. Well, you know what, um, Professor Jones, there's, there's two things I want to um, make sure I do real quick, real quick. Uh, one, mm-hmm. as you talk about that, uh, the listeners need to remember uh, someone earlier. Uh, things you think about between black and Asian um, engagement. Uh, Latasha Harlings out in California, you know, uh, that was like, people think it was the Rodney King, but it was Latasha Harlings that got uh, shot and killed inside the uh, the, 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 the store. Store. And the yeah. Yeah, exactly. But um, I don't want us to get away from the time without people knowing how they can get in contact with you and follow you and track the progress of the Independence Day project. So let the people, let the audience know how they can follow you, where they can reach you, get your your your, your office hours and all of that. Oh, uh, it's real simple. And I tell everybody, my name Carl. You know, being Carl Jones is a very anonymous name. I can hide like a needle in a haystack. Nobody would ever find me. But when you look up <laughs> Carl Stone Jones, <laughs> I'm the only Carl Stone Jones on Google or the Internet. If you, if you type in Carl Stone Jones, I'm the only one you'll find. 
And you can follow me on my website, What About Us, at www.wauwhataboutus.com. It's www.wauwhataboutus.com. And um, for updates, you can also follow me on Instagram, um, is uh, Carl Stone 11. Um, you can follow me on Facebook, Carl Stone Jones, Google Hangouts, Carl Stone Jones, YouTube, Carl Stone Jones. So, um, and you know, you can go to my um, professional page, it's Professor Carl Stone Jones. Um, I have a What About Us page on um, Facebook. But basically, if you type in What About Us, I mean, if you type in Carl Stone Jones Office Hours, my show will come up on YouTube, my show will come up on Facebook. Um, and Instagram was the other media. You said I was on Periscope, but I was on Instagram. So it's a yeah, I simulcast office hours um, on Facebook, Instagram, and on um, YouTube Live. And uh, I show them at all the same, you know, I, show, I simulcast at the same time. And I haven't done the show recently because I'm really close to finishing the film. So I've been putting a lot of my free time into the film. So mm -hmm. I probably will do a show this week. Um, just to keep people in the loop as to what's going on and, and also update them on current events. But um, I, all, I, I'm really been focused on getting this movie done. Hopefully by this time next month, good brother, the movie will be done. <laughs> okay, so, okay, okay. Brother, brother's been in the lab, man. I don't even sleep. I try to, I try, I, I'm angry with myself for going to sleep sometimes because, you know, like they say, <laughs> when you work the result, it's not, it's, it's not, you don't work an hour at all. You know, you don't work some time. So I see, you know, this is my, my baby, my project. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to thank some people, too, if I got a chance. I'd like to thank um, my brother Patrick Irvin, uh, Joe Joe Ward. You know, you know Joe. Joe, that's my brother down in Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good brother. Giant. Yeah, you know, everybody needs to get in touch with Joe. That brother's, you know, boots on the ground, boots on the pavement, and um, yep. out in the community. I'd like to thank, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Mooney Gamble, uh, Eric Tolbert. You know, for helping out sharing. They do a lot of um, sharing behind the scenes work with the project. Um, I'd like to thank um, my family down in, um, you know, um, New York. You know, I see my New York family, my, my brother Q Butter, um, brother IJ Tayama. These are all people in the project. My sister E Queen, mm. you know, our brother Born, Mastermind Allah. You know what I'm saying? I'd like to mm. thank, um, you know, my brother Chris Everett for helping out with some of the, you know, tips and clues he gave us. Um, and, you know, it's very, very, very integral, you know, to what we're doing. You know, I like to thank, you know, the family here in Philadelphia, my brother Arnett Woodall, you know, um, my um, brother um, brother Oba, who does the African Independence Day celebration in Malcolm X Park the first Saturday every, uh, the first Saturday every August. So if you're in Philadelphia, you make sure you show up the first Saturday, I believe it's August 5th, um, on Malcolm X Park for um, the African Independence Day celebration. So we're going to be out there, you know, um, I want to thank um, Raw Space for giving me an opportunity. I'll be at Raw Space in New York um, on May 8th. I want to thank um, my brother, Aji Kayemba, for doing that because we're going to try to do an independent day um, project panel and discussion. Um, I want to thank, and it, it, listen, if I let you name out, it, blame it on the, my, my head, not the heart, because I am just extremely thankful for everybody that's contributed, all the people who donated, you know, to the project and to help me with the equipment and, and to push this, this is a community effort to get this movie done, and it's based on community results. So we're trying to do something that's different. And, and all, I'll be, um, you know, I have to also give thanks to all the ancestors and elders who put us in a position to be at this point, who taught us, who gave us the education. You know, um, I mentioned some of them earlier, Dr. Henry Clark, Dr. Henry Clark, you know, um, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Amos Wilson. So, so I mentioned a lot of earlier. <clears throat> also, you know, um, the 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 um, the filmmakers on who put out, you know, the, the Tariq Machines. The um, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I mentioned my brother Christopher Everett earlier. Um, the uh, you know, I just I just wanted to thank all of them. You know, um, my brother Raheem Shabazz, who put elements. Oh yeah, we had out. we had him on last week. Yeah, we had him on That's last right, week. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I heard that was a that's a great show. That's a, that's a that's a solid brother right there. You know. Yes, um, yes, yes. I'm looking forward to this private. My brother Chuck Duncan, who came up with revolving doors. You know, um, talking about the prison industrial complex. All these brothers and sisters that that put that work out. You know, my brother Sabir Bay, who was part of um, you know, some other films. Uh, you know, out of out of the um darkness. You know, what I'm saying all these mm -hmm. brothers and 
that the sisters have put their work out that, that, that helped out. I mean, I just appreciate all because we're standing on their shoulders right now, you know, to, mm. to steal or borrow the um, term from my brother Joseph. We're standing on the shoulders of these giants as we propel to stand. Without their work, we would not be able to do the Independence Day Project. The community would not be in a place for the Independence Day Project if they weren't doing the work. Right now, the Independence Day Project is not a wake-up project. I hope it wakes people up. But the Independence Day Project is a project that's based on dealing with people who will say, okay, we're here. What's up? We need to, where's the next part? We're ready for the call. So this is what we're doing then. That's what the Independence Day Project is for. Now, um, this is not going to be the only Independence Day Project split. I'm telling people that now. Because as we do this part, we're going to focus on the international black community and the international mm-hmm. diaspora. And we're going to focus on, you know, building that up. So I'm just looking forward to it, brother. And I just thank you so much for having me, you know, um, on the Source Network. You know, I think the world of you, good brother, we did that, um, you know, we did that movie review of Get Out. Oh, yeah, and, Get uh, Out. Yeah, 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 that was dope. <laughs> that was you dope, know, if man. anybody has a chance to check that, yes, sir, bro. Yes, sir. Yeah, you I'm going re- I'm to re- I'm repost that. I'm going to repost that. Definitely. And listen, bro. For the next, I'm, a, I'm telling you now, for the next Independence Day Project, you know, I already got you pegged. So don't okay. you see me pulling up in my green deep down Volvo. You see me pulling up on <laughs> down there coming down D.C., man. Just, just, no, I told you I was coming. <laughs> All right. No doubt, no doubt. Well, listen, everybody, this is Professor Carlton Jones signing in, telling you all about the Independence Day Project, what the future has to offer if we put our hands in the bucket and get it working. Uh, this is Dr. Moore Swagger signing out on Source Radio. We got to thank our sponsor, Scott Cares Foundation, WGLRO.com, Urban Grandstand Digital, and Meet My Types Matchmaking. Source Nation, if you want to hit me, you can hit me on Twitter at DocSwag06. My website, www.blackladder.net. Facebook fan page, 2MASC. That means two minutes and some change. If you want to see some of my articles in YouTube, you just type in my name, S-A-M-O-R-I, Swigert, S-W-Y-G-E-R-T, in YouTube or the Google search engine, and you will find a plethora of information and dialogue. Once again, Source Radio wants to extend a warm welcome and thank you to Professor Carl Tone Jones on the pendulum. And we are out. Peace. Get at me for peace, y'all.